And this is what you should feel and you should think about. Is the goal high enough that if I hit it and I do the training and I work hard, and I put all the effort in, am I gonna be thrilled by the result or is it gonna be like, well, that was okay? Because if it's, well, that was okay, raise the bar because everything improves in your training. The way you attack it, your attitude, your work ethic, the habit is hard formed because you know you can't skimp on this work if you really want an A star in, in the race. You've got to do the work and so it raises your entire game. Okay, how to go from 60 minutes for 10K to 2.48 for the marathon. Massive, massive leap forward. But I'm not just gonna pick out hypotheticals and maybes. I'm gonna to talk to you from experience. I went from not being able to run 400 meters to two years and one month later running Seville Marathon, and you can check this out, in two hours and 37 minutes. I'm gonna tell you exactly how I did it, my strategy, and exactly how I would do it today 14 years later with all the experience I have and all the knowledge about the mistakes I was making at the time and a faster way to get there. Now, already just on what I've said on the title, there'll be people literally tearing their hair out and they'll be saying it's not possible and it's unsafe to aim for that much progress in two years or he's genetically gifted or he has a natural ability or a sports background or he was able to turn this into a professional gig and that's why he was able to move forward so fast. It's incredible how much energy certain people will put into convincing themselves why it's not possible for them, but it's possible for an outlier. And they will call me an outlier in this potential. I heard exactly the same when I said it was any, any possible for anybody to run a sub three marathon. But my question is this, how long are you gonna hold yourself back with bullshit excuses? Or are you going to let yourself actually get towards your potential by removing some of those limiting beliefs. I think that's a really, really, really powerful point. Now, I'm gonna tell you exactly how I attacked this. I'm gonna tell you exactly how I started. And first of all, I'm gonna give you the date range. On January the 3rd, and I've got these dates, on January the 3rd, 2010, I went out for what I thought was gonna be an hour run. I wanted to get back into running. It had been 10 years since I'd run. I went out and I had to come back five minutes later. I couldn't even make it 400 meters. Fast forward two years and one month, and I ran Seville Marathon, and you can check this, February the 19th, 2012, in two hours and 37 minutes. I'm gonna tell you exactly how I did it, how I attacked it, my strategy, but also, given the experience I've got now and the knowledge of all the mistakes that I made, how I would do it differently today and how you can do it differently so you can literally do that in half the time. Now, number one, you've got to become obsessed with the goal. If this is an afterthought for you, and you wanna get faster at a marathon, great, but you're not gonna make huge gains forward. If this is literally takes over and becomes your almost number one priority, for me it was easily number one, two, and three, then it's possible to make massive gains on what you're currently capable of, even if you've been training for three years and it's kind of been ad hoc or you've inserted some structure, but you don't really know, if you're honest with yourself, you don't really know what's working and what's not. You can make huge gains. Now, secondly, it's quite contradictive. You have to be realistic with your goals. And what I mean by that is when I started in January, went out 400 meter run, had to come back five minutes later, couldn't run the next day because I hurt my quad and then sort of gradually got back into it, but had lit that fire that I want to do this and do it to the best of my ability. I then thought if I want to run a 10K or a half marathon and a marathon, I didn't even know what ultra marathons were. In my mind, they didn't exist. Nobody ran further than a marathon. But if I want to be able to run a marathon one day, it stands to reason that I need to be able to run a 5K. And then I need to be able to push that as far as I possibly could. So I focused on the 5K. And what that did for me, which definitely was sort of me stumbling, stumbling on something that propelled me forward and could do the same for you, was that led me to interval training, which I, you kind of, it's so obvious. There's 5,000 meters you've got to run for the park run or the 5K. You're gonna have to break that up and try and run it a bit faster, break it up into more segments, try and run a bit faster, then longer segments, try and run a bit faster than that. And what these interval sessions do for you is of course, it's gonna change you physically you're going to become a different version of yourself in the mirror. You're going to build big 
powerful glutes and hamstrings that propel you forward. And weight training will add that, but I didn't even get onto this yet for, for literally three or four years. It's going to affect you physiologically, which is the main benefit that we're looking for. And the physical benefit is a byproduct. But for me, the biggest benefit, number one by far, is the mental benefit. If I'm gonna go out and do 12 times 400 meters, that interval session is so much more powerful for my progress and my result as a 5K runner because it's gonna to get to rep five or rep six. And I'm like, I don't know whether I can make it. I don't know whether I can hold pace. I'm not recovering properly in between these, in these recoveries. My heart rate's not coming down. And what it does is, if you break up a 5K into, okay, first kilometer, let's go out there and start strong. Second, third kilometer, let's, let's, it's gonna to start to, we're gonna to start to struggle. Fourth and fifth kilometer, you're gonna die a little bit, but that's when you really need to push because you've only got less than 10 minutes left. It's exactly the same as an interval session. So psychologically, you're building a warrior to go at the 5K. And the 5K is a difficult distance to get right. I know we've got park run now, so everybody's running them. It's a very difficult distance to get right. And what I mean by that is push yourself and be on the limit for the entire time. Whether you're running 13 minutes or 35 minutes, it doesn't matter, you're on the limit. And so I started to get better and I went to a couple of park runs. I ended up having my mate's bib and getting in the Buper Manchester 10K, got on the start line and all those nerves came back. It was a bit different to the park run, which felt like kind of a social gathering. All of a sudden there was 40,000 runners in the center of Manchester getting ready to run on a Sunday morning and I wanted to win the race. And I was so proud of the, the sort of mid-race or finish line picture. I posted it on Facebook and somebody invited me to a 50K uphill race called Valletta in, in Spain. And so I accepted this challenge, not even knowing what ultra running was. And I just went to Spain for that race with the thought that I, I want to finish it. I want to beat the cutoff time of eight hours. And I ended up finishing in five hours 17. But the biggest part for me was this fire that I'd lit in January when I started running and I was rubbish. I looked up at the podium and I saw three guys. I remember their names really well. Modesto, Alvarez, Ignacio Moron, and Lorenzo Trinchiri from Italy. And it wasn't that, of course they've won the race in second, third. It was what their legs said to me. They, I, I saw muscle fibers and, and muscles that I didn't even know existed. And it was like a snapshot of 20 years of hard work or 10 years of hard work in order to get into that physical shape in order to be completely fit for purpose, to be fit for mountain running. And the upper bodies were that of cyclists. There was nothing to them. And I had never seen physiques like that, but I saw what it, what, it, what it required in order to be the best. And literally on that day, I said to my friends, three of my friends that were there, Pedro, Susanna and Bridget, I remember so well that I said, one day I'm gonna win this race. And Pedro turned to me and said, Haha, you know, basically in Spanish, calm down, you know, it's been a good day, but you know, don't get ahead of yourself. And uh, I remember it so well, but it lit a fire or it, it kind of just, poured gasoline on the fire that had started in January. So then I get back to Sweden, October, November, it starts to get cold and therefore you're kind of indoors. I joined the local running club that was training indoors. I was also running on a treadmill. That gave me, joining the running club gave me a little bit of structure. I go to interval sessions and I do the indoor interval sessions. Is it optimal? I, you know, I look back at my sort of Tuesday and Thursday nights at each Cheshire Harriers and you just got there and then you found out the session. So it's very, very difficult to look at progressions unless you're going every week and it's tailored specifically for you and your level. But with this session, it was kind of exactly that. It was like, you know, um, you get there, you'd find out what the session is. But in terms of like the contacts, the uh, invitations to races and the knowledge, absolute gold. And I'd highly recommend anybody who's getting into running, joining their local running club. It is, they are beautiful people. So then I'm, get, I'm getting into races and I'm kind of searching for races and desperate to get out of the Swedish winter. And so I find Barcelona Marathon in March uh, 2011. And I go there with the idea that sub three hour marathon and I run the first half in 129. And I think this is easy. I'm gonna run a sub three and then from there I can, and literally a kilometer later, I remember it so well, 22 kilometers. I thought somebody shot me in the back of the ham hamstring and it took me almost two hours to get back. I was in something like 500th or 600th place running a sub three and all of a sudden 2,000 people passed me in the second half. And it's the weird thing about failure. 
Like, there's that quote that we all know, which goes something like, I say we all know it, and then something, it goes something like, smart people learn from their mistakes, geniuses learn from other people's mistakes. But when you make a mistake in something like a, a 5K or a marathon, whether it's sort of a short, short-term suffering or long-term suffering, like sort of one and a half, two hours, you don't forget those mistakes. And so it teaches you on a deeper level, I think. And you're not going to want to be there again. And it's going to make you stronger in a way that you're not gonna to wanna to leave that rock unturned next time you're training towards it. So it teaches you, okay, I need to have more endurance. Okay, I need to be more conditioned in my quads. I need to get my fueling sorted out. I don't want that to happen again. And then a couple of months later, I drive from my house in Sweden over the border to Norway to do a six hour race. Not because I think I can, but because I just wanna get my hat in the ring. I wanna be around other runners. It's very infectious. And you learn stuff. And so I'm doing a six hour race and it's two kilometer laps and I run about 66 kilometers. There's a lot of stopping and starting in the, in the second half. And I don't know how to pace it because who would know how to pace the six hours if they'd just been in running less than a year. And I remember finishing that race and you know going to the bathroom and, and literally pissing blood. And so something had gone wrong. It's probably to do with my stomach rather than sort of, um, you know, I'd torn something in my stomach and therefore it wasn't a big problem, but it, I, I was just making all the mistakes that a novice would make. And so then all of a sudden it's getting towards the end of spring and we get sort of, oh, we're working towards summer and this Valletta race is coming along, which is every August. And so I'd done that the year before. I wanted to improve upon my time. I wanted to go back and run with the same people. And I went back and I ran 30 minutes faster. So I ran 4.47 and came 24th. And then I'm like, well, if I can sort of, improve that amount of places and improve that amount of time in just one year. Now I know the course, now I know what I'm doing. What that did for me is I'd already decided the year before, but what that did for me was literally say, you're living in the wrong place. And in order to become the best possible runner, by that point, I well made my mind up. Even from January, 2010, I'd made my mind up that I wanted to be a pro runner. But that was like, move yourself to Granada, train on the course, get better at that race, and then you'll get better at all of the races. As simple as that. A marathon will become easy to you if you can run this another 30 minutes faster and then maybe towards four hours and then towards the podium. It became that clear. An environment for me is absolutely everything, which is why Jim Wormsley moved to Chamonix in order to train for UTMB. And that's the only year that it worked for him so far. And then I'm making all the mistakes that I would say if you wanna get injured, do exactly this. And I did this in October 2011, and literally first weekend, half marathon, all out, as fast as I could, literally tasting blood at the end. The, the second weekend, 10K, all out. And third weekend, flew to Spain and did 54 kilometer trail. I had no right even going to a trail race and running mountainous races. I was living in Sweden. I had some uphill ability, but I had no skill at descending. And so I'm doing all the things that would set you up for a really big injury. And so <laughs> it's just like you're throwing, every, you're throwing your hat in the ring. You've got the work ethic, but you're overdoing it massively. And the training was definitely mirroring the racing. I was training like an animal. I wanted to do really well. I wanted to become a professional runner and do it full time so I could reach my potential. And then. I'm training like a madman towards Seville Marathon. And you know, I've got November, December, January, February, and round just after Christmas, maybe two weeks into January, I moved to Granada. And so I'm training, I'm up at 800 meters altitude. I'm training for, um, to go on the sub three at Seville Marathon in February, on February the 19th. Coming off the back of the Barcelona Marathon where I ran three hours 25 after horrendous second half, and just thinking, I wanna get on the sub three and tick that box. And I highly recommend you do not go into things wanting to tick a box. Life is too short. Don't be afraid of failure. Like if you go for it and your, your, your aim is way high or your goal is way high and you come off short, the likelihood is that you're going to get higher or get a better result than what you would do if you aim safe and just check that box. So I'm there the night before Seville. I remember it really well. We got, I went across with my mate Mick. We stayed in this cheap hotel. There was a party next door. I couldn't sleep. So I'm, I'm literally working out my pace the night before. I knew I needed to run 4.15 per kilometer to do sub three. But I thought, what would I be happy with? And the answer to that was 2.40. At sub 2.40, I'd be happy with that. And that would put me in a good place to run sub 2.30 another year. And those are the round numbers that we aim at. And so I did the maths for that. I think it was like 3.37, 3.38. And 
This is the thing, and I got this question in the comments, so I'll read this to you because it works right now. If I can consistently run 10 to 15 kilometers of my long run, 10 to 20 seconds faster than my planned pace, which is 437 per kilometer, should I go for a faster pace? And this, for me, is the reason I was able to leapfrog things. Instead of che checking off each level, it's not a computer game. You don't have to complete level one before you get to level two. You can check yourself along the way and think like that lad has. Hold on a minute, I can hold much faster for 10 to 15 kilometers of my specific long run. Intervals indicate much faster. What should I be capable of? That sum is often very, very difficult. But I'd sat there the night before, and this would be my advice to him, I'd sat there the night before and gone 240. I think it's not just kind of like, you can't just go there as, you know, intending to run sub five hour marathon and say, actually, I fancy a 230, do the maths and then run that the next day. You've got to look at the training. What does the training indicate that I'm capable of? And in this case, it worked because the next day I went around the first half in 119. And bear in mind the year before I'd had this horrendous second half. And then run the second half of Seville in 118. So I came back in 237 for the marathon. And for me, and this is what you should feel and you should think about, is the goal high enough that if I hit it and I do the training and I work hard, and I put all the effort in, am I going to be thrilled by the result? Or is it going to be like, well, that was okay. Because if it's, well, that was okay, r raise the bar because Everything improves in your training. The way you attack it, your attitude, your work ethic, the habit is hard formed because you know you can't skimp on this work if you really want an A star in, in the race. You've got to do the work. And so it raises your entire game. And so if you're at 50 minutes for 10K at the moment, Start with 5K, start with a kilometer. Start by, okay, how fast can I run a kilometer? And how does that feed in? And how do I start to put intervals together in order to run a fast 5K? If I can run 5K a minute faster than I currently can, what does that do for my 10K time? And then if I'm looking further down the line, the faster I can make those times, the 5K and 10K, the more experience I've got with putting a training schedule together or listening to a really good coach, which is your shortcut to get where you really wanna go. Take the knowledge from somebody else the best money you will ever spend. Then if you do your 5K and 10K faster and you've got the training experience, you know what structure feels like, you know what intervals feels like, half marathon, marathon, ultra marathon, the world's your oyster because it's all there for you. But aim high enough that it makes you excited to get out there. Because if you're passionate, if you're obsessed with it, if you can get obsessed with it, then you know, you're, you're literally superhuman because it's all you ever think about. So all of a sudden your sleep is on the, on, on the check. Your stress, you realize, I've got to reduce the stress because I don't want that. So I need to get rid of my job. How do I get rid of my job? Can I turn this into something if you really want it? And I get, I get that not everybody wants to be a professional athlete. Your, your diet, do I, do, I really want to be, do I really want to be going out with the lads for 20 beers tomorrow? No, it's probably not going to help my Sunday long run. And so your whole life gets put in check because all of a sudden you have these lofty goals, which also, nobody else will believe you and it'll even not respect you because you're delusional, like I said at the start of this video. So the message from this is be delusional. Aim at a point where you currently think it's not possible and I bet you have a lot more capability than you're giving yourself credit for.